Hello, everyone. My name is Shelby King. I am the investigative reporter at Shelter Force. Uh, I wrote a series of stories recently uh, that discussed um, the relationship between YIMBYs and tenant organizers. And we got a whole lot of feedback and a whole lot of interest. Um, and, and we decided to kind of expand the discussion uh, and, and see if we could discuss some of the past and really move forward and talk about how we can hopefully cooperate um, and at least uh, work on some of our shared goals between tenant organizers and uh, YIMBYs. So we have a really excellent set of panelists. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, introduce everybody and then I'll give everyone a chance to uh, talk for themselves and introduce themselves. But I wanna get this part going. So first we have got uh, Professor Lisa Bates, she is a professor at the Toulon School of Urban Studies and Planning at Portland State University and a Portland professor in innovative housing policy. She is also a member of the research team at Evicted in Oregon. I have to read all these because everybody has so many, uh, so many um, roles that they fill. So the second one is Margot Black. Margot is a tenant rights organizer activist and advocate in Portland, Oregon. Uh, she is also a founder of Portland Tenants United, but is no longer affiliated with them. Uh, she is here speaking on, on her own or, or for herself, not as a representative of any uh, affiliation or organization. Next, we have Ernest Brown. He is executive director of Abundant Housing Atlanta and a board member of both Yimby Action and California Yimby. We also have Laura Lowe, who is founder of Share the Cities, which is a Seattle nonprofit focused on housing justice, land use, and digital equity. We have got Alex Schaffron, who is a housing consultant in California and also the owner of Schaffron Strategies. And we have Sia Weaver, campaign coordinator with Housing Justice for All, which is a New York State-based movement of tenants and unhoused people fighting for housing as a human right. Um, so. Those are our esteemed panelists. Um, Miriam, my boss, is putting uh, links from everyone over in the um, over in the chat. If you would like to learn more about what our panelists uh, represent or are all about, uh, so next I want to just kind of go through some housekeeping stuff and kind of explain how we're going to run things. So we have a really large panel. Now we've got six people, uh, not including me. And there are a lot of really strong voices. Um, we have a lot of really strong opinions, and these are some sensitive issues. So in order to make everything as organized as possible and try and stay on time, I've got a list of questions uh, that I'm going to be asking to individuals and then to some folks as groups. Then everybody will get a uh, set equal amount of time to respond. Uh, and if we have some time in these set questions, I might let other panelists respond. It just kind of depends on how time goes. Uh, so with that, I would like everybody to remember to keep themselves muted so we don't get any feedback or um, we can hear all of the answers fully. Um, we also know that there are a lot of emotions involved in the issues that we're gonna talk about. And so we just want to remind everybody that we are here to be respectful and we want to look forward. Um, we are saving time at the end, hopefully about 20 minutes for a Q&A session. So if you have comments and hopefully constructive questions that you want to ask along the way, if you could please put them in the chat. The panelists, myself and um, my boss, Miriam, are going to be checking out the, um, the chat to pull out questions that we can ask at the end. So we're hoping to get as much time as we can for audience participation. Um, I also want to stay up front before we get going too much that we really want to have this conversation to focus on moving forward and focus on the possibilities for cooperation and hopefully collaboration between YIMBYs and tenant activists. Um, but we also think it's really important that we acknowledge that part of the reason that we're having this discussion and that this discussion is necessary is because there have been some like hurtful and some harmful interactions between groups, between people from both sides of the groups. And we want to make sure that we acknowledge that and that those those interactions are not dismissed and that they have caused real harm and that we need to, uh, you know, sit with that, but then also hopefully try and move forward. 
this is my last thing and then I'll go ahead. So we also wanted to in in the in the interest of moving forward, we wanted to share some past coverage and just including coverage from Shelter Force that kind of gives an idea of how we got here, uh, what the YIMBY situation is, what tenant organizing situation is, how they have worked together or not in the past. And so Miriam is going to um, put a series of links over in the chat that both we have uh, supplied from Shelter Force and I also solicited from our panelists who sent some of them in. So that was it from me. <laughs> Thank you everybody for listening. Um, thanks everybody for joining uh, and, and coming to this with uh, a positive constructive uh, attitude. I'm really looking forward to it. So with that, I would like to say the first question that I'm going to ask is a group question. Uh, this one is for Sia, Ernest, uh, Laura, and Margot. I want to give you guys three minutes each, uh, hopefully maybe with some time at the end if we have some. Um, I would like, kind of going back to our my what I just said about the past, I would like to offer you guys the uh, some time to introduce yourselves if you would like, uh, and then provide a couple examples that to you illustrate uh, the current state of the relationship between tenant organizers or housing justice folks uh, and uh, Yimbies and and and. Hopefully we can we can talk about it in a constructive manner. Uh, so I want to give everybody three minutes each, and if it's okay, I'll go in alphabetical order because it's what I've done so far. So Sia, if you don't mind starting, um, I'd like to ask you that question. Sure. Um, before I dive in, can you hear me? Can someone yes, give me a thumbs up or something? Great. Thank you. Awesome. Um, so. Uh, just by way of introduction first, uh, my name is Sia and I am the coordinator of Housing Justice for All, which, as y'all said in the introduction, is a statewide coalition of about 80 grassroots tenant organizations and organizations that represent homeless New Yorkers in New York State. Um, and we have worked across the state of New York to sort of build a people power movement that is capable of challenging the role that the real estate industry plays in our state capital, Albany, New York. Um, our primary focus for many years has been on strengthening and expanding our state's rent control system. So um, we were tremendously successful in, in 2019 in strengthening that system and, and rent control is a top priority of the organization. A second priority for our organization though um, is more housing for low-income and homeless New Yorkers. So we've had some success on that front, um, including passing a statewide bill and winning money to convert vacant and distressed hotels into, um, into permanent housing. Um, but we've had, we've had sort of like less, maybe less success on the front of like building truly affordable housing for New Yorkers, though, you know, as an organization that does represent people who are currently unhoused, um, the question of, you know, creating housing opportunities for people who currently don't have them is at the forefront of our minds in housing justice for all. Um, just to like give an example of like the current state of play, I think between, you know, the I, I, I honestly like I'm, I'm here and I'm happy to be on this panel, but I don't like to word, use the word Yimby. Um, in New York City, where I am based most of the time, a lot of people don't even have backyards anyway. Um, and I think the sort of isms, um, Yimbyism, Nimbyism, whatever, are sort of like, you know, have become so triggering for so many people and have like, captured too much attention. When really what we're trying to talk about here is what kind of housing are we building and where and who is going to have power over what that housing is going to look like. I think power is really central to the type of conversation that we're having. Um, when we are building more housing is that sort of like entrenching and cementing the too much power that many of my members feel like the real estate industry has over their lives. Um, or when we're building more housing is that creating housing opportunity for people who are shut out of the housing market? Is it creating a pathway to collective control over land and housing as a resource um, and a resource and a source of power? Um, so when I'm sort of thinking about the sort of current state of play between like people who want to like build more housing and people who are organizers in the tenant movement, um, I'm really thinking about like 
what are people's different definitions of power and what do people think the, the best path forward is um, in order to, I guess, address a problem that like I agree with the, with the Yumbi movement on, which is that there are way too many people in New York State who, who don't have homes um, and who don't have affordable homes and are not um, stably housed. Um, I'll stop yeah, there. <laughs> thanks. And I'm, it's the first time I'm going to have to do it, but I have to stop everybody at three minutes. So and, and thank you. No, for that. thank you. Yeah, and uh, we will definitely come back. Uh, and and I appreciated you uh, weighing in. Uh, so Ernest, uh, you're alphabetically next. Can you explain a little bit uh, about your thoughts on how the relationship between Yimbis and tenant organizers got where it is? Happy to, and I'm timing myself, so we'll try to stay on three minutes. Um, so I'm, I'm Ernest. I'm currently here based in Atlanta, Georgia, which is where I'm from, but I spent five years in the Bay Area, which is where I got active in sort of the founding of the Bay Area YIMBY movement. So I'm on the board of YIMBY Action, the 501c4 that's been very active over the last several years and sort of advocacy around local and statewide housing issues in California and increasingly has become a national organization over the last few years. I also just joined the board of Yes in My Backyard or YIMBY, an affiliated 501c3 that does a lot of impact litigation and sort of other research work around the housing issue, but does not engage in politics given the C3C4 line. So I, I can speak as an institutional actor and both of those lenses are helpful. Um, but to this question, I guess I'll give both an Oakland and an Atlanta example here. Um, I'll do the Atlanta one first, I think is really interesting in this conversation of the dynamic of a blue city and a red state, which is true of a lot of your Sunbelt sun, sun Belt metros, so your, your Texas's, your Florida's, your North Carolina's, where a lot of people are moving to. And the, the power structure such as it is that we were just talking about is really one of like not caring a lot about tenants. Um, Georgia prohibits any, any form of rental regulation or even that seems like it might be rental regulation. I heard the state of Tennessee um, uh, preempted the city of Nashville from regulating uh, Airbnbs. Um, there have been similar types of statewide F state efforts to preempt uh, anything that might seem like progressive local legislation on housing issues. So the power dynamics of both the NBs who are trying to change power to unlock more housing and tenant actors who are trying to change legislation to unlock more, more, re more re regulations on, on rentals are actually quite aligned and sort of facing a not accommodative state apparatus and trying to figure out how can cities be creative with the powers they do have to unlock, unlock opportunities for both renters and aspiring homeowners and, and the communities that are seeing a lot of population growth. Like essentially every one of your fast growing metros is in that some boat area. So the, the, the problems of abundance and sharing enough are like very present here in Atlanta and elsewhere in the Southeast. Um, but I will give it a, a couple of California examples. I think a more recent one is the California Social Housing Bill, which has been a bill that the YMB Action chapters I know are supporting actively in California. Um, and I can speak to my time when I was in Oakland, though we actually invited the Oakland tenancy unit to come meet at a space we had and think about what were the resources we had as so there's no abundant housing activists to try to share and make, make more fruitful those, those relationships at, at a local level. Um, so I, I've seen some positive movement there, but I think it's become more structured over time as at least the movement I'm affiliated with has become more institutionalized over time. And I'll get back a couple seconds. That I just took up by not being unmuted and ready to go. Thank you, Ernest. Uh, Laura, uh, would you like to weigh in, please? Yes. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Laura. Um, I'm uh, a presenting person with uh, white presenting skin. I have brown hair and um, dark eyes, some gray in there, I'm wearing a black sweater, a white shirt. And behind me is my pea patch, which is a public community garden that is in Magnolia in Seattle, Washington. Um, I founded Share the Cities first as an organizing collective, then I was Patreon funded, and then two nonprofits to address uh, kind of a holistic vision for both King County and Washington and connecting with mostly YIMBY organizations across um, the US and beyond. I went to the first YIMBY town. I spoke at the second YIMBY town on what I considered to be uh, a critique of the YIMBY movement. My talk uh, is on YouTube. It was titled, um, it was about intersectional urbanism and what that meant to me. I was born in Bogota, Colombia. Um, I bring a lot of different uh, past organizing experience around immigrant rights issues in Chicago and um, housing and uh, food justice work when I first moved to Seattle. Um, I'm a renter. Um, I moved here in 2009 and Share the Cities is basically a group that can mobilize for other people. So 
we get tapped by tons and tons and tons at this point, hundreds of organizations every week, it seems like uh, to mobilize our folks who are show up, they show up to testify, they show up to mutual aid, they show up to stop sweeps, they show up to do electoral work. Um, and it's kind of a, an organization can kind of borrow our people power for their movement building. A lot of the folks in Share the Cities have a lot of uh, privilege. And so a lot of the work I do is around um, making sure that folks show up to organizing spaces and do less harm. So I really see what I do as civic matchmaking, but I have been very instrumental since the beginning of being involved in the MB stuff, including the MB town in Portland most recently. So um, it's very complicated. I have a very complicated relationship. At this point, I say that Yimby for us is a verb. It's part of many of the things that we're doing, like public broadband advocacy and other work. And it's just part of, of making a city better. And that Yimby is a, is a land use reform shortcut. And uh, it's a, you know, a term. But on the internet, on Twitter, um, I've been very involved in the like housing discourse on Twitter. Um, which is why I think I ended up here today. And I'll say more later. Thank you, Laura. And you ended up today here today uh, partially because of the cooperation aspect and what you just said about the way that uh, Share the Cities has focused on, on really building that bridge. So Margo, um, you are the last official responder to this question. Can you talk to me? A little bit about the state of the situation in Portland, please. Yeah, and I'm setting a timer too because I historically go over time. So my name is Margot Black. She, her. Um, I founded Portland Tenants United, um, which uh, aspired to be a citywide tenants union, um, essentially using the labor uh, organizing model to leverage our collective power to pay rent or withhold paying rent to um, affect changes in um, you know, policy or through building-based organizing um, to you know, renegotiate our leases or otherwise um, you know, change the material conditions that we're living under and challenge power um, and uh, have enjoyed a lot of pretty exciting um, successes since, since starting that organization, including um, in 2018 statewide uh, passage of statewide uh, rent control. I, I'm going to put it in quotes because it's a little too high to really be called rent control, 7% plus um, plus inflation, but a rent stabilization policy. And we also were um, kind of the main architect, architects of passing um, a relocation ordinance in the city of Portland that pays renters who are displaced through um, uh, rent increases that they can't afford or um, no cause evictions. Uh, a, a substantial amount of money um, to offset the the very real costs of of moving, um, and uh, you know I bring up those that work um, and the founding in 2015 to highlight that that really happened um, around the same time, kind of uh, you know yeah really at the same time as what would become Portland's Yimby um, movement. And when I came into this work, I, I am a renter then and still, and certainly probably forever, and a, and a mother and a, and a single mother. Um, and uh, a lot of, there was a lot of stress in that time about rents going up um, and who was to blame and a lot of um, different ideas about, you know, how to create a more livable city. And, um, and oh, and I meant, I'm sorry, I meant to mention, I came in, into this as a math professor. And so I had this STEM, background that I applied to this problem. And so I personally was able to see that with more people moving to the city, we do need more bodies, um, but we don't, um, but we have to make sure that the people who were here first can still live here and still enjoy the city that they helped build, that they raised their babies in. They wanna make sure that their babies can move back here and help take care of them. And that's really my North Star is that everybody um, deserves housing that is both secure um, and um, uh, secure and, and dignified, and that the vision is that anybody um, can find housing that is um, affordable, you know, quality, dignified, that they can um, stay in, afford and stay in, in perpetuity, in the community that they need and live, uh, that they need and want to be in, and that's what really guides my work, and I realized I didn't even talk about the Yimby stuff. Well, that's okay, because we'll come back to it. And actually, we are going to stay in Portland, actually, now, because thank you, everyone, for weighing in on that. But I, I'm going to um, 
ask the question next of Lisa, who is also in Portland and, and who can talk to kind of the genesis, Margot, that you just talked about, which is when the, the your Portland Tenants United kind of got going and everything went a little crazy in Portland was right around the time the, the Yimby movement got started. And uh, Lisa, when we spoke last week, you talked specifically about how Portland has been able to avoid uh, some of the uh, conflicts that we hear about often in the Bay Area or in, in New York City. Uh, and, and you talked a lot about um, how how housing justice folks and, um, and, and Yimby folks were able to come in together in Portland. And I would love if you would talk to us some about uh, avoiding some of the conflict and some of the cooperation options that you've seen. Sure. Um, well, you know, of course, in Portland, we're very nice, read uh, passive aggressive. So the conflict, as hot as it gets, is still pretty lukewarm. Um, but really, I would go back way further than just the, this kind of recent Yimbyism. Um, time travel isn't available to everyone on the call, but um, Oregon has a 40-year-plus history of a state land use planning system that one of its goals requires that all jurisdictions plan for needed housing at a diversity of types, locations, and meeting the financial capabilities of all Oregonians. So we have, that doesn't solve the problem, but it has avoided some of the worst, most hardened um, NIMBY exclusionary land use policies and practices. Um, we also have urban growth boundaries, right? So um, in the Portland metro area in particular, um, land use, environment, climate advocacy folks have always also been connected to the question of housing. Um, really because the urban growth boundary, the densification of the city, the transit planning is like probably most threatened by a, ver a fake affordable housing argument. It really is not about people who care about housing affordability. It's driven by home builders who want to build green fields, you know, from here to eternity because it's easy for them to do so. Um, and so there's always been a connection long before Yimby of folks in that movement, in the um, land use planning, who are very connected, not only to housing availability, but through groups like Housing Land Advocates, very strongly to enforcing the real meaning of Goal 10, that it's a diversity of housing for all income groups and fair housing. So they've always also been talking about race and racial exclusion, which obviously happens everywhere in the country, but there's some special history in Oregon around racial, racialized exclusion. So HLA and also organizations like 1000 Friends of Oregon um, have been, you know, fighting for regional fair share housing. They were been fighting, they fought for a long time to get rid of the state preemptions on inclusionary zoning. Um, and 1000 Friends of Oregon incubated um, both the organization that ultimately has become the ADPDX, the Anti-Displacement Portland Coalition, and Portland Neighbors Welcome, which is probably the most, um, you know, sort of the most organized abundant housing supply group. I actually don't think they say YIMBY very often, uh, maybe because of some of the, the, the tensions around that label that other folks have mentioned. Um, but being incubated in that same space or sort of was a dialogue from the beginning um, such that I think, uh, you know, Portland neighbors welcome, you'll see them much more so focusing their attention on historically exclusionary areas of the city and the metro area, um, more so than historically disinvested areas. Um, you will see them showing up for anti-displacement provisions in the residential infill um, rezoning and upzoning in the city. They show up, they have showed up for tenant protections. They have shown up on tenant screening, on just cause evictions. Um, and they have also led on sort of investigating some of the racialized dimensions of housing exclusion in the city. Um, you know, they, they will put forward, you know, concept plans for like turning the golf course in the rich neighborhood into a housing development. Um, they've just really like focused their spatial advocacy around a different, different place. Um, and I think that, you know, contextually, because of Portland's, um, Portland's a kind of old school growth machine city, there's sort of like some guys you could name their names who control the land and do the development and own stuff and, you know, go in the, in the back rooms with the cigars. It's actually really easy here to see 
the market not working. It's really easy to see how the market does not supply abundant housing routinely. Like that's actually econ 101. Um, when prices go down, we stop bringing things to the market because our, you know, there's some tangencies and marginal costs and marginal uh, revenues there. Um, and so it's like, I think it's been easier to sort of see some of the common problem um, and understand that the supply of housing, the abundance of housing, the diversity of housing is interlinked with racialized exclusion, is interlinked with dis disinvestment over time, um, and cannot be resolved by sort of poo-pooing the idea of displacement. Um, it has to be a conversation that happens all at once. And I think this longer history, but then this, this deeper history is really important, but this immediate um, moment and space in which climate, land use, environment, um, housing, and equity have sort of formed in the same crucible is is really like part of that um, ongoing collaboration. Thanks for that, uh, Lisa. And, you know, so then uh, Laura, Margot, Sia, Ernest, as, you know, folks who are like on the ground, um, do you, does any of that either ring a bell for what is something that you see that is going on for cooperation in your area, or is what Lisa's saying, like bringing up any opportunities that you like see that could be new in your area? Uh, so I don't, does anybody want to jump in and go first? I don't, uh, Laura, you're raising your hand if you want to start. I just, there's so many in everybody's stories here that echo my personal story as well as our city stories, both the growth boundary in Washington state, the growth management act really informs our conversation at a state level and kind of, um, helps everyone, even if we don't agree on like, it, there's this idea of concentrating growth to protect wild lands. That's like a shared value in Washington state that reminds me of what goes on in Portland and that helps for unity. And then the fact that Washington state has such abysmal, such horrific tenant laws, so in favor of landlords and property owners, some of the worst, uh, you know, least protected tenants in the US are in Washington state. And that really does create a, um, a place where even some market leaning folks are like, yeah, we need these runners are really vulnerable. Like we need some sort of stabilization. And so just things are so bad that like we're not fighting as much in the nuanced areas in those two places. So I just want to and then also I was a math teacher. So there was like a lot I, I related to there. Thank you, Laura. Uh Margo, do you still have your hand up? Did you want to weigh in? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, neat that you were a math teacher, or, or Laura, that's cool. Um, uh, I just wanted to, uh, yeah, underline what Lisa had said about um, the, the YIMBY groups in Portland um, that in particular testified in favor of tenant protections, um, both uh, locally and at the state level, um, including our rent stabilization policy. Um, and, uh, and I think that that has um, been a very, very important um, component of the YIMBY and tenants rights groups having a, a, a partnership is some mutual uh, support of, of causes. Um, and that, you know, to address um, what somebody has brought up in the chat about whether or not, you know, tenant groups and YIMBYs, for lack of a better word, could say agree to disagree on rent control and agree on everything else. Absolutely not. Um, as long as we can also agree to disagree on supply, you know, um, like that's that's really core to a tenants rights activists, um, you know, toolkit for housing security and, and anti displacement. It's not the only one. And certainly the conversations are very nuanced. But the thing that is so, you know, that what, what has gone, been so successful about um, Portland's tenants rights movements and the MBs is that they haven't disagreed on that. And that, um, I mean, there, it hasn't always been an easy conversation. Um, and uh, I will say that the YIMBYs do, you know, if, if pushed, they'll, they'll often break for the developers or, um, um, or break for the, the Econ 101 teachers who think that um, rent control will lead to the end of the world. Um, but in general, that was a really, really important part of building trust and showing when you can get a group who you believe is sort of you know, led either secretly or not by greedy developers, 
to come in and testify in favor of, of you know, what at the time was considered a very uh, radical policy, it was, it's, a, it's a really, really big deal. And if those two groups can't agree on that, um, I, I, I just don't think, I don't see how we can ask for abundant housing and all get on board with that while we also agree that um, we are going to savagely, you know, push people out of their homes and communities, um, at, you know, as soon as somebody else can pay a higher price. We don't apply those, that perfect market uh, principles to home ownership, and I don't know why we would apply it to renters. Um, and I think that we need to, we need to ground our housing work in making sure that people can stay in their communities and enjoy the benefits of housing stability, because that's when we free up the energy to, to work on all the other stuff and build our communities back. For sure. And, and I appreciate actually that you brought up the question in the chat, because I do, uh, I'm, I'm going to hopefully come back to that during the question and answer session, because I think it was an important one. Um, in to stick with this question for now, though, Ernest, I see you've got your hand up. Would you mind weighing in, please? Sure. And this is actually kind of going back to something that Lisa was pointing out. Um, this notion of like the growth machine has also been like really fascinating to kind of see with new eyes upon getting back to Atlanta. And it is very much that similar dynamic of like, there's like a handful of almost exclusively old white guys. Um, um, although they, they've diversified it a little bit um, in, in Atlanta who are driving like the major development projects in Atlanta. And they tend to be quite problematic, both from like a, the, what we're talking about here, both from like a basic like tax policy standpoint, they tend to often get like heavily subsidized um, from government. A recent book, Red Hot City by a professor at Georgia State sort of chronicled how we're just giving away like hundreds of millions of dollars every year and sort of very needed um, public tax revenue to support sort of like stadiums and other kind of me me mega developments. But one exciting thing I really liked about coming back to Atlanta is because it's not such a highly um, procedural process to build any amount of housing, there's still like an industry of people who build duplexes and townhomes and other kinds of small forms of middle, missing middle housing. And that's actually been a really useful sort of like agreement point that like, well, that's that's not what's sort of like ruining our, the notion of an neighborhood. And that's not what sort of like is um, causing massive displacement things that's happening in parts of Atlanta. It's really this other thing that's happening. And so how, how, how do we reorient the development trajectory of Atlanta to be less sort of no massive scale blockbusting sort of urban renewal 2.0 into this more neighborhood scale development that can actually be led by members of our neighborhood um, because that actually has a much more diverse developer financer class behind that model of development. So that's been like a helpful alignment point here in Atlanta. Interesting. I've been really fascinated talking to you and just learning like like just that you've got such a unique opportunity uh, in Atlanta right now. So I'm I'm interested to see what happens. And Sia, do you, um, before, we've only got a few seconds, but I would love to, if you want to weigh in on this, um, before we move to the next question, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, totally. Um, so in New York State right now, our governor is pushing forward a statewide plan to encourage cities and municipalities and towns, particularly along our regional rail system out of New York City. Um, so we're talking like the, the cities, the suburbs, and the cities immediately surrounding New York City um, to increase their residential density. Um, and Kathy Hochul's zoning plan encourages, you know, municipalities to sort of like up zone. Um, and it doesn't, these are already like extremely high cost neighborhoods, right? So it's not like a plan that is particularly leading to more low income housing or affordable housing. And it's not a plan that um, it's not a plan that is, you know, leading with tenant protections or housing affordability whatsoever. Um, and it's presenting this opportunity for the sort of nascent Yimby movement in New York State to, I don't know, lobby on behalf of this plan to sort of take on these are like some of the most exclusionary places in the country. We're talking Nassau County, Westchester County, where places have been, you know, I don't know, suing to block multifamily housing development for decades and decades and decades. Um, so it's sort of interesting to see what's going to happen there. These are conservative places that typically don't vote for our Democratic leadership in Albany. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens as this nascent movement, you know, tries to like bring some of those things across the finish line at the state level. 
Um, at the same time, we are pushing very hard for tenant protections and rental assistance to be a part of this conversation. Um, and we are, you know, treading a line that basically says, um, you know, we're not trying to stop this zoning plan, but we think it's not going to work for anyone at all to produce any housing, especially for the people who need it most, unless it has rental assistance and tenant protections included. Um, so we'll see um, what happens and where where this goes and if there's opportunity for uh, for collaboration here at all. I, I think it's sort of early to say. Well, thanks. And that actually gives me a good um, opportunity then to talk more about cooperation in legislation uh, and, and move to Alex. Uh, and, and so Alex, uh, you were involved in the California social housing bill. You, you, Not really. I'm an observer. You are an observer. Okay. A, a, an active observer. Anyway, um, give so me credit I, for nothing. I, I spoke recently with uh, Shanti Singh, who is the legislative coordinator for tenants together in California. And she said that during the last round of negotiations uh, for the social housing bill, that there were some really positive conversations around um, getting some of the asks that tenants rights folks had into that social housing bill. I know that the social housing bill didn't move forward last time, but I realize it's probably not dead in the water. I'm sure it's, we haven't heard the last of it. Where do you see opportunities um, moving forward uh, for if it isn't reintroduced or if there are other affordable housing bills in California, where are you seeing some opportunities for collaboration there? Okay. Um, well, thank you so much. Uh, and since we are starting with the question of who gets credit, just want to first shout out um, you all, Shelby and Miriam and all the Team Shelter Force for having the courage to write about this topic, to put this on, you know, I think, I know some people, you know, were thinking maybe there's going to be some shouting when we come on here today. Um, I just really appreciate it. It's a super important, you know, the coverage that you're giving of this, these conversations and folks trying to make peace here and, and find ways to work together really actually helps move that forward. You're having a really productive uh, impact on the housing conversation, I think. And I think that's really important. And I hope other journalists are paying attention to what that means. And I think that's one thing I think everybody on this panel shares is an interest in just this conversation that we've been having has to produce better housing for, especially for lower income folks. Um, and so I just appreciate that productivity. Uh, also happy to be mentioned in the, in the same breath as Shanti Singh. Uh, shout out to Shanti. I don't know if she's listening. Sasha, I see you there reporting, hopefully. Um, that's a person who's been, you know, sweating blood for decades for these things. And so I, I, I try to be helpful where I can, but I don't uh, deserve nearly the same credit. Um, you know, speaking from the California space, and so I'm a long, former academic, a sort of longtime observer of these things and writer about these things. I guess I still am a writer. Now I'm a consultant, so I'm actively working in coalition building. And I'm now a member of e Ernest's old organization, East Bay for Everyone. Um, I'm also a member of East Bay Housing Organizations, which is sort of a center of the housing justice movement here in the East Bay. I identify, you know, as a houser hardcore and, you know, I'm sort of an all housing all the time person. And, and I've been thinking about this and, and trying to figure out ways in which there can be peace. So yeah, you mentioned one, which gives me a lot of hope, which is the sort of push around social housing. Um, again, I don't think we didn't get there in the last, Cal we had a, an amazing run last California legislative session. Uh, this year, it's going to be interesting. I, I don't want to sort of sully the waters, but tune in in six months and we can talk about California social housing 2023. Um, yeah, we didn't, you know, one of the things that gets talked about is, you know, this was a bill that was led by the Yimby organizations or some of them, again, East Bay for Everyone, Derek Sagehorn, shout out as a real sort of key intellectual and political force and energy force behind this. We never got to the point where we were able to get, uh, or the, the bill authors and sponsors, again, I was not part of it, never got to the point where we could get the equity groups on. And there's a lot of backroom conversations, uh, but I don't view the sort of 
not getting there as a sign that we're not going to get there. I mean, there were just so many conversations that just had never been had before. I mean, we're talking about a crazy huge plan for social housing in California that would have been unthinkable five years ago. The fact that these conversations are even happening is a wonderful sign. And in typical, like, you know, it died not because of this in any way, like hardcore, serious, old school, you know, legislative politics, that had, some of which had nothing to do with housing were what ultimately, uh, you know, saw this piece die. And again, as we move forward, I'm confident that we'll be able to get there. Um, it's hard and it's not just, you know, sometimes activists on, on in kind of Yimby side or in, in tenants right side, think that they're the same, or the only people in the room, but, or act as if, but again, in this case, for instance, a lot of the affordable housing developers also didn't get there. Um, and some of them who've had a really hard time kind of becoming tenant advocates slowly but surely they're moving. My own organization, East Bay Housing Organization, that I am proudly part of, took a very, very long time in its history to become pro-tenant. And that's a, something that I know is sad. A little shout out to the recently departed Gloria Bruce, who, you know, again, sweat blood for years to be able to get her organization on the right side. So there's so many people in housing. It's wonderful to hear people talk about the growth machine. Um, I think the one, you know, which is a, a great book about sort of the complexities of uh, of urban politics and how it relates to growth. And I think we're starting to see, I think both tenants rights and Yimby activists take a more complex and nuanced and complete perspective on like this massive system that we have that either does or does not build the housing that we do, or, you know, that we desperately need. Um, and I, again, social housing is one of them. I could use the rest of the hour talking about other areas of collaboration, but we'll start with that. Well, uh, speaking of social housing and tenant protections, uh, Laura, you are um, you've got the Seattle social housing bill working its way through. Um, and can you talk to us some about uh, any tenant protections that are written into that? What what how collaboration happened if it did and, and what sort of um, like what sort of steps you took to facilitate that, please? So. So I could talk about this probably for the next 40 hours. So if anyone, uh, this is like a taste of it. So if anyone wants to follow up, please reach out. But I did see a question that, that kind of gets to this quicker in the chat about shared enemies. And um, I don't think in Seattle, the shared enemies between what I'm gonna call from now on urbanists who are basically our EMBs, urbanists and the left, which you know could be called FIMBY. I'd say that our shared enemies aren't just big developers or big property management companies that you know do predatory investment and are predatory on renters. But another shared enemy we have is NIMBY homeowners who in community councils and chambers of commerce who want homeless sweeps and cops uh, when we know that neither of those help get people into housing. So in Seattle, there's a broad agreement among um, the most active, loudest urbanists and uh, the folks on the left, uh, you know, that maybe were involved in the uprising, occupation of Chop Chaz, that then um, faced a backlash from the conservative, like, you know, downtown chamber interest in Seattle that put forward um, a, their own ballot initiative that, that we all worked together to get to fail, which is really exciting that it did fail um, over a legal challenge, but we were gonna make sure it also failed if it went to the ballot. And then out of that no came to yes. I was not directly involved, but you know, back to my role as a civic matchmaker and making sure that the folks that have kind of more maybe educational privilege or wealth privilege or you know, different, different privileges um, could show up in solidarity with most impacted communities or someone that reached out to me after that failed and said, you know, I really wanna do a progressive tax thing. Um, you know, is that something sure the cities can do? And I was like, you know, let's find out what the folks that have been kind of on the ground the most fighting this, uh, you know, push for more carceral solutions for homelessness and all of this nonsense. Let's see what they're going to come up with. And so out of that grew a really deep partnership between a lot of the like social justice urbanists and folks at Real Change, who then worked with their Real Change vendors, which is a street newspaper. Um, and other partners, uh, uh, really wonderful black leaders in Seattle and um, many other folks to come up with the social housing initiative I-135. We are today, it's fairly exciting. Uh, I hope all of you will follow along. We are seven days out from the election. So the election is next Tuesday. We'll find out whether Seattle has a social housing developer. 
in the uh, the tenant protections in it, it goes back to see, uh, I think it was Margot Garcia's point about power. This is really a conversation about power and the power imbalances in our like electoral systems and then you know just our day to day systems. But this really tries to get at that power imbalance with a tenant led board. Um, union built, and then any new buildings, you know, not the buildings that would get acquired by the developer, uh, which is another path that they could take, but any new buildings would also be passive house green standard. So this brought climate justice on board, unions on board, uh, you know, you've got mainstream, you know, dem orgs all on board, you've got teachers associations, you've got pretty much everybody supports this. I would say that you know the the very 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 small quiet soft little like no that's come out is around the fact that this goes up to 120 20 percent area median income, which in Seattle for a family of four is around 144 thousand dollars. So there are some voices that are like, oh, this takes the focus off of under 50 percent AMI or under 80 percent AMI. But other than that, we've pretty much had. Uh, unanimous support. There's been a few people asking questions, um, but what I would say in terms of that grassroots, getting getting rid of that kind of yimby fimby Twitter housing war thing piece that goes on, I would say you know this gave us all something to like row in the same direction, to fight against the same interest. Everybody knows that once this gets built, there'll be a fight around where to site it. And that 75% of the land in Seattle is off limits to new multifamily housing. So there's just no disagreement among folks on the left in Seattle. Um, someone who's a big unifier on this, who I wanna give a shout out to is Sean Scott in Seattle DSA, who was when he was running for city council, really emphasized exclusionary zoning. You know, you're not gonna build new social housing in the wealthiest community like Laurelhurst in Seattle without rezones and you're not gonna be able to place the social housing near some of the most beautiful parks in Seattle um, without rezones. And so that, that rezoning piece is just a tool to make sure there is that geographic equity. Um, and yeah, anyway, I could go on for a really long <laughs> time, but the, the folks at Real Change, you know, worked with vendors. Um, this is the, the tenant, the, the majority tenant board, I would say is the most powerful thing and there's nothing I can't say this enough to all of the developers in Seattle, all the nonprofit housing folks and the PDAs that are already exist in Seattle. There's nothing stopping them right now from putting a majority tenant board together. There's nothing stopping them. And this should inspire them um, regardless of what happens next Tuesday. Hmm. So that makes me curious, Sia and Margot, uh, as, as tenant organizers, like in listening to the talk about the social housing bill and some of the protections that are in there. You know, I know that um, going back to Shanti, she said that tenants together didn't oppose the social housing bill, but they didn't get on board and support it. So what sort of provisions would you need to see, Sia and Margo, in a, a social housing bill that so that your group or, or you personally would come out and, and in active support of a social housing bill? Um. I could go first. So I don't think that social housing is like, I, I guess I would say it's sort of, I, w let me just talk about how we're talking about social housing in New York, maybe. Cause I think that will answer the question. Um, social housing for us is housing that is democratically controlled by residents. It's decommodified and permanently affordable and protected from the private market um, and is public. Um, and we're sort of using it both as an umbrella, we sort of, an umbrella term maybe is the wrong phrase, but we really rely, and I'll, I can put in the chat in a second when I'm done talking, um, we rely on the community service society's definition of social housing, which really treats it like a, a more of a spectrum than like this is social housing and this isn't, right? It's like housing can be more or less social. Public housing is social housing in some ways because it is like fully decommodified, fully public, um, it's also really over policed and residents don't feel like they have strong decision making over what's happening in public housing. So there is, there are ways in which public housing is really social and ways in which it isn't. And so like, we kind of are using it as like a way to evaluate where certain types of housing that currently exist, um, and, and, and analyze current types of housing on like, on sort of like a, a matrix or a spectrum. And that's been a really useful tool um, because we don't really want to be in a fight about like, this is social housing and this isn't. And like, it just about something that barely even exists in the US. Um, so 
So I will just sort of start by saying that. And then the second thing I will say is that we are drafting um, our sort of approach to social housing legislation in New York. Um, it's going to be, we're trying to figure it out, right? It's a state authority um, that is capable of expropriating existing housing. A huge thing that is coming up for us in the social housing conversation here is that so many of our members live in substandard housing owned by slumlords. And we really feel as though a really good faith thing that the sort of social housing Yimby style organizers can do is support a housing plan that leads with providing tools for residents of existing rental housing to take control of their homes and to transfer those homes into the public sector. Um, so we're leading with that sort of like expropriation angle. Um, the second thing is that housing is poor quality too. And sometimes people want to live in brand new housing, right? And so our social housing authority, it, we are envisioning that it is going to be able to build new housing, particularly in um, like some of like the slower growing parts of New York state where the market just isn't going to be able to do it. So we're talking to tenants in Utica, we're talking to tenants in in Rochester and we're saying, you know, in these places where maybe there's like less housing demand or like Yimby organizing wouldn't necessarily go, right? Because like the demand doesn't, the demand isn't there. Um, the economies are slow, but people live in substandard housing that they don't wanna live in. They want new housing too. Our social housing authority must be able to address that with like deep rental subsidies and the ability to build in those places. Additionally, it has to be able to address building housing in high cost neighborhoods um, where the market is producing housing that people can't afford. So we are really talking about social housing as something that is, because it's run by the state, flexible enough to meet really different types of markets, which like a zoning only social housing plan can't really do. Um, something that's capable of building state capacity and something that you know can like lead with like helping people get better homes right now. Um, and then the last thing that I will just say about social housing is we are not starry eyed about what we think we can get the New York state government to do. And we are sort of situating this in a long-term power building strategy to take control of our state government through people. Um, and so, you know, I am here in my 501c3 capacity, but we are closely aligned with organizations like the DSA and the Working Families Party that are explicitly taking on housing as a core electoral issue. Um, and running candidates who want to build state capacity for housing. Um, and, you know, the Social Housing Authority also would have the power to override local zoning, but that's not what we need to lead with because zoning isn't the core of the issue here. Thanks, CEO. Uh, Margo, are you, um, did that resonate with you as far as what it would take to so to support a social housing bill? And can you weigh in on on your thoughts there, and then maybe some of what uh, you have going on in Portland, some of the issues that you're working on getting legislation or new regulations passed uh, to increase tenant protections? Yeah, um, uh, really, I just um, I, I have hardly anything to add to what Sia said because she was so uh, thorough, and I'm just ready to move to New York and study her. <laughs> Um, and get involved with everything you're doing. Um, but I, I agree at kind of the outset on just getting it defined. I'm actually, um, uh, I'm a tiny bit out of the game on, on the advocacy circuit. And so I, the social housing phenom of the last couple of years um, is new to me. I, I'm, I just think about public housing, which is kind of sort of the same, but different, but really just decommodified housing first and foremost and as Sia mentioned you know democratically um you know run I mean the tenants have whoever's living in that housing needs to have power and agency um and over their housing and and uh and in their community um and so I I support uh I support you know all supply initiatives that move toward a goal of yeah essentially um you know, nationalizing our housing supply would be the goal. Um, uh, but anything in between where we are now and there, um, I think for a tenants' rights movement to support, you really do want to see tenant protections built in. Um, uh, I, I would say as a, you know, as a renter who was radicalized by my own lived experience of no cause evictions and unaffordable rent increases, and then working with folks in the trenches who are dealing with, you know, 
what I dealt with, but a thousand times worse because of you know additional barriers and lower incomes and whatnot. Tenants who are who do have the, any capacity to do any kind of organizing under, you know, while being crushed by the gears of capitalism, have a really hard time getting super excited about long-term supply initiatives. Like we're just not going to door knock you know, for um, affordable housing bonds and for inclusionary zoning and for, um, you know, supply initiatives that are going to come down the road in 10 years, not because we don't believe in them, not because that isn't what we need and want, but because the situations we're dealing with are so acute right now that what is going to get folks to call their legislators or knock on doors or go out into the streets are things like rent control and no cause eviction and ending no cause evictions or um, you know, application fees and, and screening and application barriers and whatnot, things that are really abil affecting our ability to like just get by day to day and know where we're going to live from one month to the next. And so it's just, I, it's just been my experience that it's hard to activate renters on supply driven stuff um, in mass, in mass. Thank you, Margo. And I, I, I hear what you're saying, and I, I totally understand that. And I think that that is a good, a, a kind of a good segue to sort of touch on what I've seen a few uh, chat questions go by. That it, where are the, where are the shared goals, right? Like, like what can we get tenant organizers? to go door knock for and what do tenant organizers need to see Yimby show up to door knock for and who needs to go first and whose responsibility is it to go first I think that that has been a question that has come up for me a lot is uh, in a power dynamic like we're talking about like where is the uh, you know what what can we agree on what can we support each other in and then who makes the first move I don't really have anybody to call on for that. Um, so anybody want to volunteer? I, I want to just try the question in reverse a little bit because we have heard it framed the other way. What, what is is there any expectation that that Yimby should expect to see some sort of commitment from tenant organizers before they would be willing to enter into coalition, or it's just the other way around? I, I'm gonna. I, I, I can see the heads nodding. Um, and I, I just want to like name that that's like an expectation being set. Well, Ernest, uh, I wouldn't say that. Go, I, I mean, I've been asked to testify as a tenants' rights organizer. Like, I we've been asked to support movements, but it hasn't been a. It's usually been an exchange. Well, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, what was was my question clear? I think you? so. Like, do we do do are you do you need tenants to to door knock for us, or is it the other way around? And and who comes first? Right, but I, I guess I, I was hearing a little bit of a question and what Shelby was saying of sort of, no, what what the tenant organizers need to see from NIMBYs to believe that they are about this coalition? And I was like trying to just like revert the question, but swap the nouns. What 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 the NIMBYs need to see from tenant organizers to believe that they're about this coalition? Or is that a is that a fair question? That's sort of what I was asking. And I, I was interpreting the nodding and of different directions. Like NIMBYs don't get to ask that question. They should just be ready for the coalition and they should be so grateful to receive it. And, and Lisa, you seem to be speaking, are you? Lisa, are you? I'd love, we can't hear you. I'll give you, we, we can't hear you talk, but I would love to hear from you. So um, if your um, speaker starts working. Uh, Ernest, I, I don't think anything is an unallowed question, but I do think that that question comes up, like are, if, if YIMBYs are in a position of power and like, like we have talked about oftentimes newer, especially YIMBY groups tend to be uh, upwardly mobile, often white. Uh, they have seats at the city council table. They get listened to more often. Uh, and so uh, with that sort of automatic power, does there come a place where it, it falls to Yimbis to show up first because they have that sort of power? And is, you know, and I think another thing that has come up in this research is are tenant activists willing to accept that help when Yimbis show up and they show up sincerely? And what needs to happen to show tenant organizers that Yimbis are sincere? And I keep going back to Sia and Margo for this one, but I think that uh, 
where I would love to hear what tenant organizers need to see from Yumbies to accept the help that they that I hear over and over from folks that I interviewed for these stories, uh, folks who are in abundant housing groups say very much to me, like, we want to help, we want to help. I would love to hear what help needs to be illustrated. And I think the, the point of me fr framing that question was to try to get at this notion of, it's a little difficult to ask for a coalition, but like kind of like demand that the other partner always be the junior partners of the coalition, but also they're the powerful one. It's, just, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult notion of like coalition building as it's sort of like the, the price CMEs must pay to enter the coalition is to accept all of the tenant organizers sort of values, positions and prioritizations. And then for they get to be in a, in a coalition in which like maybe they will see their priorities advance, like maybe, but only after they've achieved the other ones. Like that, that, that that's what I've seen historically be like one of the confounding factors to sort of like building the building it as a coalition versus getting Yimbies to sign on to the tenant organizer sort of like program. Does that make sense? Like it, it it's absolutely the case in Atlanta that sort of like neither of us are getting what we want. <laughs> and so sort of like there's a there's a very very clear sense of like we will be stronger together and maybe some of the things we want will come to pass. But I think in some of particularly like West Coast cities where like tenant organizers have a long history of like winning things and sort of like are earning rent control in San Francisco, earning it in Oakland. And so then in that situation to treat the Yimbies as the one with the power, when like the the, the individual Yimbies, the Yimby groups that sort of I was a part of that founded, were, were not the rich developers who designed the current land use regime. They were the ones who were trying to change the land use regime. So they didn't perceive themselves as powerful, even if their sort of broader social class may put them in sort of like a and in some sense, a, a, a relatively stronger sense, but like the tennis unions had staff. <laughs> the early Yemi movements had no staff. So just when you were thinking about who has the power here and who who is being asked to give or accept, just those dynamics, I think, were a little more complicated. I definitely agree. The dynamics in the whole situation are are complicated, which is why we are having our conversation. So, you know, I would like to, if we, yeah, I, sorry. no, go for it, please. Yeah, I, I think that like power is a bizarre concept and difficult. I just, I do, I do want to just like sort of push back slightly on the framing of like what's happening in California and like tenants, one tenant organizations have staff and one rent control. So they have power and EMBs don't have staff and the land use re regime is like not, is what they're trying to change. So I, I think it's sort of just like a little bit, um, I think it's just like more complicated than that, right? Like, so when I think about, um, when I think about power, I'm sort of thinking about, and I know you, I know you know it's more complicated than that. So I'm not trying to, but I know just for like the sake of like oversimplifying for this, for this conversation. Um, Yimbyism to me, I mean, people have been asking me this question a lot. Like, what do you make of all the new Yimby groups in New York, blah, 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 blah. You know, and like it, like it's this new thing that like our governor is pushing housing and there's EMB groups now and blah, 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 blah. I don't think it's actually like a new thing. It's really about like supply and demand, which is like probably like a fun, it's like a fundamental sort of philosophy behind like our a whole economic system and property ownership and building more housing as a way to sort of like solve the housing crisis is like fundamental to are like entire, like the entire approach to how we're solving the housing crisis. Um, and tenants are trying to do something different. They're trying to say like, actually we're permanent renters, actually we need stability in our homes, blah, 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 blah. And I see where like people who want more housing and want more rental housing can, th can think about how, the, how to like build together. I also can see how it's frustrating. Um, I do think though that like that sort of like analysis, like tenants have political access and therefore power and Yimbies don't, isn't like, sort of accurate to how power shows up in these conversations. I, I, I think in terms of like building a coalition, um, I, I don't think that like solidarity means that like, okay, like Yimby's carry our agenda and we carry Yimby's agenda, that's not gonna work. I would maybe just take a huge step back and be like, all right, what are like the shared values here? Can we work on something new together? Maybe that's a social housing bill. I don't know. I think like the, the sort of framing that like, I'm gonna like, fight for zoning changes if you know open new york or yimby group supports good cause eviction that's like really not like where we're trying to go and, and it's not like 
solidaristic, solidaristic. And so I don't know, I'd like to maybe start with thinking about like where we aligned and like maybe we can work on one thing together that is on both of our agendas um, as opposed to like we're carrying each other's work. Yeah, I, thank you. And so going off of that, what are some of the shared goals? Lisa, can, do you want to see if we can, can you hear me? Yes, yay, okay, great. Success. I'm on like um, headset number three for the webinar. Um, I think, so I have a different question about this premise, which is why are these two completely separate people? Why, 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 are, why is this dichotomized in that there's like one kind of person and another kind of person and they never the twain shall meet. And I actually, so one of the things y'all, as we were talking about the webinar prep is that I revealed that I do not participate in Twitter. It makes my life um, nice in a lot of ways. And one of the key ways is that it's possible for me on an individual basis to get in a room and have a conversation with people around housing that is not primarily shaped by an online conversation. And I genuinely worry that there is a conflation between a very real and serious analysis about power and politics and the way that stuff shows up in a really unproductive online space. Um, because we have to have a really serious conversation about power and the real politics, material politics of what's going on. And we do not have to have that in the terms that people fight about each other with each other on Twitter. When I see the spaces that come together in Portland around anti-displacement and broadly defined YIMBY, um, some characteristics are that the people who are interested in that collaborative space, who primarily come to it on the supply side, are not mostly, uh, are not like all white, all upper middle class background, all high income, all, you know, wanting a gentrification aesthetic. It's like a broader set of people who are able to speak to um, like desires and hopes and dreams about living in cities and being in space with other people in a way that looks a lot more like many of the people who are renters and tenants, who I do think care a lot actually about development and how development happens because most of the people that I work with are very concerned with spatialized displacement and the history of urban renewal and the practices of quote unquote revitalization planning. But the conversation has to start from people recognizing that one, we do not live in an econ 101 world. So if you are a YIMBY and you don't wanna be a jerk, you cannot show up and just yell at people that more supply is good for everyone and no one ever gets hurt because that's not true. It's empirically not true. And if you insist that you know exactly what will happen on any one particular development or development on a large scale and that there will never be any consequences but great things for everyone, like you, 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 A, you don't know a lot of econ, but also you don't know a lot of reality and you don't know how to talk to other people. So I think that, I mean, I would say in general, I've seen that dynamic happen more than the other way around. And I think that's why the framing ends up being what does EMB have to like let go of? Because I do see those being the stompy feet that come into the spaces. Um, but again, I think that like, um, you know, making our movements not be exclusive to only a certain kind of demographic and a certain kind of vibe and communication style is like a big start in how we develop a real coalitional politics that also can acknowledge that sometimes all the interests are not shared. I agree with Lisa. Um, yes, I agree. Thank you, Lisa. Is uh, Alex, you had, you had your hand up. Would you like to Weigh in, please. To agree with Lisa. Uh, yes, I would like to agree with Lisa. And I, I, just a few things that I think are really important. And so I think this is super important. Back to Ernest's question of like, you know, what are the ex what are the reasonable expectations that both different groups of people, again, many of whom are like me, either members of both organizations or who are both renters. So I'm not a renter, but I am a member of both organizations and a huge believer in tenants' rights. I'm also a believer in all forms of housing tenure, including home ownership and community control and resident control. 
So I think there is a reasonable explanation that you can accept like the brutality of the history of these issues in the United States and in particularly the ways that it has devastated people of color, low income people, whole neighborhoods like this is just history and it is true. And so if you're rolling in with kind of an ideological perspective that denies so much of this history and that only like that doesn't accept again some of the reasons why some of these zoning rules which should be changed were put in place in the first place isn't just pure nimbyism by like upper middle class folks is because of damage and that was caused by the real estate industry doing things in a different era so i think some basic acceptance is important i do think it's important to acknowledge margot's point earlier is that yes there may be renters in both groups and i'm a member of both groups but the the income and the power of and you know some of which is racial related is different often in different groups and i think there is a basic like should can you expect somebody to be advocating for the things that are just necessary for your basic survival first support me in my basic survival so that i can be present and be here to work with you on these long-term visions and i think yes that's an explanation that folks have. And so, again, one of the things that gives me hope about what I see with some of the better of the YIMBY groups in California is that they're not trying to exchange support on rent protections as a quid pro quo for something else. It's like, this is fundamental. I was happy to see Ernest, you know, Laura and, the, and YIMBY Action Group issuing a statement on the Biden rental protection plan saying, that's great, but it needs to be stronger and like linking to a national low income housing coalition brief on how it could be better. Like that wasn't, that didn't feel quid pro quo. That felt like, yes, we're saying that we're here. And the other day I was in a meeting with a bunch of regional advocates on rent regulation. Uh, not, you know, there was a space where they were, and there were Yimbis in the room. And I heard somebody who was definitely not a Yimbi and who's long been a, a, a you know, a, a social housing, war, a housing justice warrior, somebody very skeptical of the real estate industry and of Yimbis, talking about how appreciated he's really seeing in this housing element process we have in California, where each jurisdiction has to make a housing plan, really seeing folks show up uh, from the Yimbi movement to really help build better housing policy at the local level and ensure that not just zoning reform is in there and new units, but also tenant protections and other forms. And that was the kind of thing, again, so I think that kind of just showing up and not, that can't be quid pro quo. The thing that I would then add as a final point is what I think is happening a little bit in California is that you are starting to see some grassroots interaction with folks. And one thing that I would love to see dropped is this idea that YIMBYs are not also a grassroots group in many cases. Sure, they may have donors and there's various people and people maybe in the real estate industry, but there's a lot of sort of folks out there grinding hard, regular folks, just like in the tenants' rights movement. And that's something that's really important. And that's a myth that needs to sort of go away uh, and die. Both are very grassroots. And because both are actually very grassroots, neither are powerful. Like we talked about the growth machines, like we, uh, if you, dig into how power actually works in the real estate industry and the housing industry in California, neither group has enough power to sort of realize its big visions. That is something that I think both groups at times are struggling, right? There are certain folks within the YIMBY voice who say, hey, we're winning. We don't need to build coalition with these equity folks. We're winning, we're winning, we're winning. When in fact, I don't think that they're, we're quite winning yet. On the equity side, somebody recently asked me on the equity said, you know, do we need a bigger tent? And the answer was like, no, we need to leave the tent. Like equity at times can seal itself within a tent space uh, based on like people who see everything like them and are, are risking in times like isolating themselves from power. Not, it's, not a pro, it's not a way of building power, it's a way of isolating yourself from power. And I think there is a slight mentality shift that needs to happen. And again, I'm hoping that in some ways if both YIMBY and equity and housing justice folks can be more okay making peace with the fact that ne none of us are particularly powerful. Like I'm parts of all kinds of non-powerful groups. And if we want power, if we want influence, we're gonna have to do some really scary stuff. And that's where it starts to get really hard. And we're all gonna have to kind of step out of our comfort zone. But I do think you can ask for that basic acknowledgement of the history of the industrious, of how bad the situation is, and of the power imbalances within our organizations as a place to begin. Thanks, Alex. And um, Laura, I, I believe you want, wanted to 
Uh, did you want to answer this question too? Yeah, in terms of the reciprocity and like the transactional organizing piece, uh, I think it's I think it's exactly. I went I I uh, a market bro flew me down to meet Sonia Trous in 2016, and and this person wanted me to be like the next Sonia Trous and start a Seattle EMB group and all of this stuff. And I flew down and met Sonia and spent quite a long time talking with her at the time. And I was just like, you know, I just felt like there was a different path forward for me because of the already the work that I was involved with, with uh, housing justice work and, and um, Tent City Collective and the Tenants Union and other things that I was doing. I was like, I just don't think that I can can start a Yimby group. I don't really feel like Yimby is a noun for me. I don't really want it to be a noun for other people. And I really, like I've said, especially recently, I always say Yimby for me is a verb and I'll show up to Yimby against design review. I'll show up to Yimby against historic districts. I'll show up to Yimby and get other people to Yimby while they're doing other things. But I, I just, I really reject it as a noun and identity. And, and a lot of folks, you know, I, I talked to a lot of folks ahead of this meeting about what do they think of like the Yimby? What is Yimby in Seattle? And all the people that kind of said to me they were confused when they first moved to Seattle and they had done land use uh, reform organizing and pro housing organizing in other cities. And they showed up and they're like, where's the Yimby group? Where are the Yimbys? Like, how do I find them? And then they realized that like, there's actually like hundreds and hundreds of, of grass roots and grass tops and there's some developer shill ones and there's some, you know, struggling, you know, just to, to pay for, you know, food for a meeting ones. And, and we actually have like so many envy groups and it's, it's just embedded in their like full platform of different things they're working on. And, and I think that's a strength in Seattle and Washington state. We, <clears throat> I heard a lot of uh, abundant housing and EMB groups talk about expanding their platforms over the last several years. And I, I wrote about the the kind of like added nuance um, to EMB platforms. And so I think um, we are into the Q&A uh, time that I had set aside here. So I want to use that and, and kind of jump into the QAs. Uh, the question that Margot touched on earlier um, that I'd like to give everybody else a chance to respond to. It says, is there a space for cooperation on some goals without requiring everyone to sign on to hot button topics like supporting rent control? And we were just kind of talking about that, you know, Lisa mentioned that there's space for coalition without having to agree on every single thing. Uh, and so, you know, speaking to the hot button issues, you know, Margo, you said, no, we can't support Yimby groups if Yimbys can't support rent control. Would somebody else please like to weigh in on, on the possibility of um, forming a coalition uh, on the, the points that do make sense for both sides and just kind of letting the things that we don't have shared goals on kind of stay on the wayside and focus on the, the shared goals? Is there, is that a possibility and how? You know, how, Sia, how, if you could, could you, is rent control just a, uh, you know, it's a such an important issue that without that support, you couldn't support any Yimby things. Um, I'd love to hear from someone on the possibility of getting some of what we want, but not all. <laughs> um, so I think I said like sort of like this quid pro quo way of talking about it isn't that useful for my perspective for like how we have this conversation because rent control is our top priority and we're going to work on rent control because that's what our base of members needs and wants um, and we want to build a coalition around rent control and just in like the sort of like capacity and time of day that like we have as organizers in this world like we're not going to walk away from that demand in order to build with YIMBYs that being said I think that there's like tons of people who maybe identify as, um, I, as like as YIMBYs who like would benefit from rent control and who want it and like we welcome them into our movement like whenever anyone endorses our rent control work we are thrilled um and when and if we're in a different position and rent control we win it or like it's not our top priority then we can sort of talk about like building a coalition but 
or like working on something sort of explicitly with like the Yimby organization. But I think the framing isn't that useful because like I'm not asking Yimbys to stop working on what they're working on. I don't think they're asking me to stop working on what HJ4A is working on. Um, so to me, it's not like, I don't know, I'm not trying to like negotiate on the terms of like what our, what our demands are. Um, I think that like, maybe there's going to be like a land use fight where we could work together because the housing is truly affordable or like some other sort of terrain is going to like emerge where we need to fight together. But, but I, I, I don't see like walking away from rent control as a demand in order to like build a coalition is like what we're, what we're like, what we're about right now, if that makes sense. And I don't, I don't know if that like sort of fully answers the question, but, but yeah, rent control is, um, rent control is like necessary from our perspective and it's always going to be necessary. And, you know, the real estate and rental assistance is also necessary and we're aligned with the real estate industry and thinking that rental assistance is necessary. So I think it's like, yeah, I would think about it that way. I hear what you're saying. Um, Ernest, I see you have your hand up. Did you want to answer this question also, please? I did. Um, two things. One, just I think the element of time that someone mentioned earlier is really important. Like all the land use changes that are quite important to the ME movement are sort of like the, those are like you know ten plus year shifts we're trying to create. Like none, none of those are gonna are gonna save somebody's house from getting torn down tomorrow unless you imp implement sort of you know, demolition controls and things like that. Um, so like the, there is a really different time balance there. And we often talk in Atlanta about like we're not gonna ask someone who's like facing imminent eviction to sort of come to this land use planning meeting that's about a small area plan that will be implemented in the next year's you no know, five year comprehensive planning process. Like that's that that's not the ask here, right? Um, so I just want to want to state that. Coming back to this question like, well, what can we work on then? Again, we have we have the gift in the South of like rent control was just like not realistically on the scale as long as Republicans have a vice grip of the state legislature and have gerrymandered themselves into at least a decade of control of, of our legislature, regardless of sort of know who wins how many votes in an election. So like it's, it's 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 not an active sort of thing to kind of potentially split split the coalitions. But what is is how much money do we have so that the city can go around and buy up dilapidated apartment buildings, rent stabilize them, or because they own them, they can rent stabilize them and also make renovations. That's been a very big issue here in Atlanta, where we're seeing a lot of speculative investment into sort of lower quality housing stock in the historically black parts of the city. And sort of the, the, the money to go get that is like a tax policy measure. And sort of like that, that's a, that's the thing we've been able to work kind of hand in glove with our local tenants rights activists at Housing Justice League about how do we unlock like hundreds of millions of dollars of local money that can be used to sort of advance the aims of sort of you know, a right to counsel or a more proactive um, acquisition strategy. And like that that in no way contravenes any EMB notions of abundance to sort of know some people believe rent control has some, some issues with. So I mean, in some way by not having that to sort of become the sort of be all end all of are, are we for or are we against, we're actually able to find a lot more sort of positive some um, ways to work together and other, other parts of the issue. Thanks, Ernest. Um, does anyone else have anything you want to add to this particular question? We're kind of coming up close to time, and I don't want to not hear anyone. I want we can try and squeeze in one more question if we, if everybody see. I saw that you said that you have to leave right on time, but I'd love to um, if everybody. Anybody else want to have follow up with this? Just like a one sentence thing. As a renter, the whole first, you know, the first several years of my organizing, when you talk about the rent being too high, you'd hear from the landlords and everybody else that we just need more supply. And that gets very frustrating as a renter to hear that that is the solution and the rent control isn't. And I think that is where at least I get so sensitive when I hear, can we agree to disagree on that? Because where we, those are my landlords who are telling me that I just need to wait for the rent for more supply to come online and then my rent will somehow magically go down even though it's only gone up. <laughs> and so I just that's where that sensitivity comes from. I think is that if if all you've been told is that supply is the answer when you're experiencing something so different, it's really hard to um to trust the the um you know the it's really hard to trust CMBs who aren't pro rent control. Does that make sense? Sorry, that wasn't short. I'll stop. Yes, that makes sense. Uh, and I appreciate I appreciate everybody sharing your thoughts. Um, 
I don't think I won't uh, try and squeeze in a last question with one minute left. Uh, I want to thank everybody for showing up, both the, the audience and my panelists. I really appreciate everyone. Um, if anyone has any last thoughts, um, I'm, I'm happy to uh, hear them. Otherwise, uh, we will make the chat available with the links in it for everyone. Um, got everybody's email addresses. I appreciate everyone showing up. Please uh, reach out if you have any questions.